Okay, uh, let's get started. My name is Bert Beckwith. I work at Oracle on the Micronaut team at Oracle Labs. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about Micronaut and GraalVM and how they work together. So, um, yeah, I'm currently on the Micronaut team. I worked for Graham Roche, who uh, created the framework. Um, I previously had worked for, uh, with Graham at uh, SpringSource and later VMware and Pivotal on the Grails team. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of uh, framework, framework development for, for quite a long time. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so let's get started. So um, I'm going to do a sort of an intro to Micronaut, an intro to GraalVM, kind of talk about how they work together, and then uh, get that out of the way. And then I'm going to do a, uh, just going to create an app, live code it, and do a demo of, of everything, getting it working. And uh, hopefully we'll have time to actually create a native executable with GraalVM. So we can take a look at um, you know the huge performance imp improvements and speed improvements you get using uh, native image with with GraalVM. So first, let's talk a little bit about the motivations behind the creation of the Micronaut framework. Um, so we had worked on Grails, which is based on Spring framework, and um, there were a lot of issues with that. One of them was, of course, the fact that the whole framework uh, was really based on, on Groovy and dynamic uh, behavior in Groovy. Um, so, and what we saw is, and this is kind of boilerplate, this is um, kind of generic, but um, legacy deployment styles were, you know, one big JVM with lots of apps running on it. Um, now we're moving more to using containers, Docker, Kubernetes, that sort of stuff. Um, with so traditionally you'd use servlets, maybe EJBs, Java EE containers. Um, monoliths were, were popular. Now we're doing more serverless. We're doing more, of course, microservices, um, streaming, Docker, small JVMs, uh, very, really quickly starting up, um, and you know deploying to the cloud, deploying to multiple clouds. This. Graph is completely made up, but it's fairly representative. This is not actual numbers that were computed anywhere. Um, but w one of the things that we found with Spring is that a lot of the techniques that Spring uses in Spring Boot, when I say Spring, just hear that as Spring plus Spring slash Spring Boot, um, and CDI and Grails use um, waste a lot of memory and slow down your application. And for the most part, it's, it's worth that cost, right? You get an incredible developer experience from all of that. But when you're trying to create really um, tight, fast, small applications, that bloat really starts to accumulate and add up. So using reflection, um, runtime bytecode generation, proxy generation, dynamic class loading, all that stuff. So you think about a Spring app when it starts up, right? It's going to scan all your classes and look for annotations, that singleton, maybe uh, at secured, um, and um, there's lots of different ways that Spring creates proxies where it'll intercept your method call, especially for security or for uh, caching. So um, it creates a, a class at runtime, which is pretty cool stuff, right? I mean, uh, it's a fairly sophisticated uh, JVM technique. Um, but the memory used to do that stays with you. I mean, you can't get rid of that. So it w if you could split up that process of doing more work at compile time and less work at runtime, then you would have a you would you would you know save a lot of resources, and that's exactly what what Micronaut does. So um, you know you don't have to use that approach in Spring. You can turn off a lot of the auto wiring and a lot of the auto autom auto magic uh, coolness, but then you have to do a lot of the, the work yourself. So. Um, um, one of the huge issues with, with reflection is that reflection gets faster every time the, the, a new um, JDK gets released. But it's still relatively slow, especially when you do a lot of it. And one of the things that, it, that uh, is done is um, when you go to reflect into one class, it caches all the reflective lookups for the entire class. Again, that waste, money, that waste memory. And it's small, it's, each little bit is small, but you know, the accumulation, accumulation of that is um, really impractical. So the way that Micronaut was designed was 
to do class uh, code scanning instead of runtime scanning. So Micronaut hooks into the, the Java C process using build plugins with, for Gradle or Maven. And it looks at your code. And it does basically the same general things that Spring does, right? It looks at um, annotations. And it looks at uh, implement, impl implemented interfaces. And it makes decisions based on that. And then it does cool, magical stuff. So, uh, but it does it at compile time. So what you, what you get is a small increase in compile in compilation time. But that gets amortized over your development process because it's not like you do everything at once. So what you get is much lighter runtimes, much smaller um, apps, and, and it's much easier to target stuff like uh, IoT or, or you know, deploy to a Raspberry Pi, you know, really um, constrained environments like that. Um, one, and I'll, I'll tell you one, th one thing. When I, I wasn't there at the very beginning when they created Micronaut. I started uh, at Oracle a few, three years ago. Um, one of the things I asked Graham when I started was, because I knew a little bit about GraalVM and native image, but I didn't, you know, I didn't know a lot until I got to, to Oracle and started working on it. And Micronaut is so seamlessly friendly to work with native image, which we'll see when we get to that, that I, I asked him, did you guys design Micronaut to kind of work really well with GraalVM? And he said, no, I mean, we hadn't even heard of it. It's just a huge, kind of a coincidence that these two things that were actually released to the world around the same time um, were really super compatible. Because one of the things, you know, I'll talk more about this, but uh, GraalVM, or na native image, when I talk about GraalVM, I'm really thinking about native image, um, can work with reflection and dynamic class loading and dynamic behavior like that. But you have to configure it, because it, it's going to create a, a static uh, executable. Um, so you can configure it with, you know, you know, with config files. Um, to tell it where those um, speed bumps are. Um, but the great thing about Micronaut is, since it doesn't really use any reflection, and it doesn't do dynamic class loading, it doesn't do all this stuff, uh, Micronaut itself basically just works with native image. Third party libraries have to you know, have those configuration files added in. Um, but you know, that's being done, and that's been done. So Micronaut's going to look at your annotations, and it's going to figure out the, uh, what your dependencies are. So if you, it does dependency injection just like Spring does. So if you have a service that needs some other service, you inject it in and, and it works. Um, it caches a lot of this information at compile time and stores that in generated code. So it's going to build up those AOP proxies. So if you're doing that intercepting, um, then it'll create a proxy, but not a runtime proxy, a compile time proxy. Bean introspections. It's, it's relatively expensive if you think about how we create REST APIs. We're going to create domain objects, right? A person, a whatever, a th you know, these domain classes. And you're going to serialize those to XML or more likely JSON, right? And then receive JSON from web requests and deserialize that into a class instance. And to, to do that, you have to find all the properties of the class, the getters and the setters and the constructors and all that stuff. When you do that at, at um, runtime, again, you've, you've got that cost. But Micronaut sees all that stuff and pre-computes it, stores it for you. So everything's right there available um, at runtime. It's already been pre-computed. You've already incurred that cost. So I won't spend a lot of time talking about GraalVM because it's, <laughs> we're here at Oracle. So um, people here are a lot smarter, about, a lot more knowledgeable about GraalVM than I am. But I'll give you a, a really brief introduction. So for me, GraalVM has three general pillars. Um, one of them is JIT mode. So GraalVM is a JDK distribution, which you can install just like any other JDK, OpenJDK, the one from Amazon, the new one from micro, micro, Microsoft. I always mix up Micronaut and Microsoft. Um, so in JIT mode, you can just it, you use that as your JVM. And because of the um, improvements that they've been able to um, add to it um, by, by virtue of its being written in Java, um, you can get 10, 20% improvement without doing anything, without creating a native executable, without creating any config files. You just literally take your, whatever you're using for JDK now, swap in um, GraalVM in JIT mode, and it just runs faster. In addition, there's amazing support for um, polyglot programming. So using Python, um, LLVM languages like Fortran, um, with your JVM languages, 
and really eases the interoperability between those. And the third thing, which is I think the most interesting, is the native image AOT compiler, which will, and we'll see a demo of this, which will aggressively look at your uh, application, anything from a single class to a gigantic jar file, you know, fat jar with all your dependencies. Um, and it can take a while, it's not a fast process, but it'll do a static closed world analysis of your application, throw away all the dead code, it's gonna analyze all the code paths. And you know, with third party libraries, you may use, you know, you're gonna use a subset of those classes. So there's gonna be a lot of dead code there. So we can throw all that away and it'll create a, an executable that runs on the environment that you're targeting, your Mac, your Windows machine, Linux, especially for the cloud. Um, and you don't need to install a J, uh, JDK. You don't need Java on the machine. You just build this native executable, put it up in the cloud, put it in your uh, Docker containers, uh, deploy it to Kubernetes, and it just starts up super fast and uses less memory and runs faster. It's, it's, it's magic. And like I said, uh, Micronaut and GraalVM work, work really, really well together because of the design constraints that you know, they put on Micronaut, the whole plan of Micronaut fits really, really well with, with GraalVM native image. And I just, here's a handful of uh, links and resources uh, I just wanted everyone to, to see. So we have, um, I'll show you Micronaut launch in a bit. We have a whole bunch of guides. Uh, everything's open source at um, GitHub. Um, huge documentation page. Um, you could, the, the way that you um, typically use Micronaut is you, there's a web launcher, which we'll see, where you can build apps, or you can install a command line MN executable, which itself is a native executable created by a native image, um, and use that to, you know, MN, I'll, I'll, you know, I, we can see that, MN create app, um, specify your features and your languages and all that stuff. Uh, and then there's support in, of course, you can go to Stack Overflow, uh, there's uh, Twitter, and then we have, uh, some Gitter rooms. Okay, so let me do a demo. Okay, so this is the, the web launcher. So this is really slick, I think. I use this all the time. So um, let's say we're gonna create an application. You, you give it the name, your base package, choose a test framework, uh, build framework, language version, and then features. This is sort of the equivalent of Spring's starters, right? So you add in a starter and it gives you all, uh, you add the starter for security and boom, you've got a secured application. You, you add in the starter for uh, Hibernate and, or JPA and you've, you've got database access. So Micronaut uh, calls in features and there's a gazillion of them. They just go on and on and on. So um, one of the neat things is, I'll just add a couple, right? So GraphQL and Jackson Data Mind. The, this isn't the real demo, but the, this website is really neat because it'll show you the whole application that it's going to create. One thing that's really nice for upgrading is if you do a diff, it'll tell you what, based on the selections that you just made, do you need to add to your application that you already have if you're not doing a greenfield new development? What changes do you need to make to your build? And then if you're using Maven, it'll show you the XML diff. And then finally, this is really neat. So you can generate, you can download a zip file and unzip that and load it up in your IDE. You can push it to GitHub and it'll use an OAuth request to, um, to do that. And I'm lazy and I forget how to do stuff. So I do this all the time. I just copy paste the curl command or the uh, command line to generate the application. Um, Hopefully everyone has heard of SDK Man. It, it isn't something that, we're, that you know, we created, um, but SDK Man installs JDKs, uh, Micronaut. It'll install the Spring CLI. It'll install Groovy, uh, languages, toolkits. Um, it's just amazing. Okay, so let's create an application. And I'm gonna call it Level Up. And this is a front end, basically a wizard front end to the website I just showed you. So it's gonna actually make a, a rest call out to that um, website. So I'm gonna add in data JDBC. So
So this is a framework that um, we have support for JPA and Hibernate, Hibernate Reactive, all that. Um, but Micronaut Data JDBC is, is pretty, pretty cool. You get a huge subset of the functionality that you're, you're used to with Hibernate or JPA without the cost of Hibernate and JPA. I mean, it, it can be a bit um, much. Um, so it just works with SQL, but what we'll see is you don't tend to write SQL uh, queries. You can, um, but the queries are auto-generated for you, just like when you're using Hibernate or JPA. Um, so we'll use that, and we'll use Flyway to do database migrations, and you can also use um, Liquibase. Flyway is nice because it's simpler. Liquibase has a ton of features. Um, I'm going to create a native image, so I want to add in the Grail VM. And I'm forgetting one. Oh, right. So I'm going to create, I have already created a, a Oracle database in the cloud because it takes a while and I didn't want to force you guys to wait. Um, so I'm going to wire up to use that database. Okay, so I created this database. It's a uh, Oracle Autonomous Database, and right now it's empty. Um, okay. So I need to create a user. Do right here. It's got this cute little um, SQL editor that you can use for basic stuff. You know, of course, you can connect a real database tool to it, but um, okay. So create the user and grant it access to everything. Okay. Now, ordinarily, when using Autonomous Database, you would download a wallet, it's called. And basically, this has your tnsnames.ora, and it has you know, all the connect information. It has the um, uh, uh, SSH keys, everything, all, all the stuff you need to connect to the database. Um, but we are going to use Micronaut support, Micronaut Cloud's support, Micronaut Oracle Cloud support for Autonomous Database to radically simplify that. So all we have to do is specify the OCID, which is the um, unique identifier of the thing, which is right here. Uh, and then Micronaut does all the rest. It, uh, in, the, in the background, it downloads the wallet. It does all that stuff for you. So. So a uh, typical Micronaut application, uh, if you've used Spring Boot, this will look familiar. You've got an application, uh, you know, a main class with a static void main uh, method that starts the application. It creates an application context, which is where you can get your beans from. Um, it'll start an embedded server, which is by default uh, based on Netty, um, which is super performant and uh, has great support for async, non-blocking IO. Um, you can, if you want to use, or if you need to use traditional servlet-based uh, programming, you can switch to Jetty or Tomcat or uh, some other servlet-based uh, approach. Um, and then those, the configuration is in application.yaml. So 
I need the OCID of the database, which is right here. I set that. And I'm going to set a wallet password. Which is actually going to be dynamically looked up. So I don't want to store this in my I don't want to hard code this in my config, so I'm going to export that as a, as a uh, config variable. I'll set the username to level up, the same name I used in the uh, when I created it, and password is going to be And then you can have multiple accounts. Um, I have several, and this is the one I'll be using. So um, this just gives you the flexibility of, of um, using different accounts right there. So uh, this is all pretty standard Micronaut. This was added by the uh, Flyway feature. Uh, this is standard Micronaut. And then this is was created by choosing the um, Autonomous database, right. Okay. So it's a database application, so I need a class that's going to represent something. So um, apologies for the huge lack of um, creativity, but rather than creating some sort of cool uh, application, we're just going to store th things. So thing is pretty basic. Uh, it has a um, name and a an amount, and it's actually store. It's 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 actually uh, using a record. You can use regular classes, um, but records are really convenient for this sort of thing because you know you want these to be immutable. So um, we annotate that this is a mapped entity which is an indicator to Micronaut that it's got to do some wiring on that. This is automatically um, introspected, which is the, the hint to Micronaut to pre-cache all those getters and setters. And, um, and of course, it knows about records, so you don't have getters. They're, you know, if you have a property named ID, then the method name is dot .id. Uh, or not, it's not get ID, it's just ID. But uh, Micronaut knows that. So this is our primary key. And it can be nullable because when you create a new instance, you don't know the primary key yet. Um, but then you specify the name and the amount. And then I've created a secondary. So records, um, uh, you get a default constructor when you have a record, which has all the all the uh, properties in it. But you can, you can create secondary constructors. So I created a second one with just the name and the amount and a null ID so to make creation a little bit easier. OK, so to work with this thing, we need to create a database access class. And those are called repositories in Micronaut. And that is just going to be an, just going to be an interface. The um, naming convention is repository, but you can call it whatever you want. The name isn't significant. But the fact that it extends one of the pre-existing repositories, and I'll show you what this is in a sec. And this is generic, and it takes two arguments. The type of thing that it's working with, so thing, and then the type of the primary key. Now I have to annotate this as a JDBC repository. This, again, is the, the trigger to Micronaut to uh, wire this up. And I also have to specify the dialect to, so it knows if there's any um, dialect database-specific uh, SQL that, that it need, we need to use to, use to use that. So we support, of course, MySQL, Postgres, H2 in memory database, and Oracle, and a couple more, I think. Um, so if we don't do anything, we get a huge amount of behavior just from this, because 
Cred repository has the create, read, update, delete stuff that, that we expect. So it's got um, save an instance, update an instance, um, find by ID, um, exists, find all, count, you know, all that, all that stuff. And then you can add your own methods um, and it'll wire those up. Now, one thing to note is that this is annotated with app blocking, which I think is mostly a, a marker annotation. I don't know if that is used anywhere. But that's a nice reminder that database actions, database activity can be slow, and you want to be careful in the UI to not allow a slow database query to lock up your entire server. So there's a trick you can use in the controller to offload um, database-related web requests onto a different work queue from the main uh, thread pool um, so that your application stays responsive and then if one query is running slowly, then that uh, user is affected by it, but not everyone else is affected by that. Um, okay, so I want to add in a find by name method. And now this may be, this may return null, so there's a couple different ways we can indicate that. We can make it nullable using a marker annotation, or you can use optional, which is the approach I'm going to take. So this will create, you, you can customize this if you want. There's a at query. So like star from yada, 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 where name equals. But you don't have to do that because find by whatever is a really extensive collection of, of uh, name parts that can be used. You can, uh, you can say between for numbers. Um, if you look at the documentation, there's a, there's a whole bunch of uh, names you can use that will automatically be created, be converted into, into queries for you. Um, so I don't have to write any precision code. This is, this is, every, this is all I'm going to do. I'm not going to write any SQL. I'm not going to do any GPA. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to use this. And what Micronaut is going to do is it's going to create an implementation of this interface at compile time that implements the interface and has code to do all the work. Because it knows, based on what you told it, what it's working with and what the primary key type is, how to do a find by ID, how to, do a, how to persist an instance, how to update an instance. It knows how to do all that stuff because you told it the dialect and you told it the type and you told it the primary key. And, and um, you can customize, but you get a huge amount of um, stuff just by extending that, that card repository. All right, so I need to create a flyway migration script. Which we're going to put here. So I'm going to create the directory for it, and then create the empty file. And then here, I put the, the uh, SQL. Well, I lied. I said I wasn't going to use any SQL. We have to use this much SQL. We have to create the table. Right? Micronaut doesn't know necessarily how, to, how you want to create the table, what constraints, and right, all that stuff. It understands foreign keys. It supports many to one, uh, one to many, many to many is all that stuff. Um, but DDL and DML are, are different beasts, right? Uh, this is a DDL, and that tends to be really database specific. DML is your querying stuff. That's easier. So typically, you're in charge of managing the database structure, and then Micronaut can do all, most of the, most or all of the, the querying, querying and updates and deletes and all that for you. So we create the table with the properties, and we'll create a sequence to get our primary keys. And the way that um, Flyway works is similar to Liquibase. It keeps a table in your uh, schema, and it records all the migrations that you've run. And when it finds new ones, it uses that naming scheme. So v1, v2, v3, v4, v5. So if, it, if you've run three, and you've got uh, four and five in there, it knows not to run those first three. It's, and if you've only got one, and it's already run it, and we'll, we'll see in the output that it'll say, everything's up to date. We don't need to do anything. OK, so at this point, 
We could run this, but I'll, I'm going to wait. Okay, so one thing I like to do for demos like this is create a data populator class. So in tests, you know, we're going to do our own data management, but for early development stage, it's nice to kind of have this helper class like this to kind of pre-populate some, some data for us. So uh, what did I do? This is annotated as a singleton, which does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, it's going to be a singleton bean that can be dependency injected into another bean, uh, which is a managed by Micronaut, or it can just take advantage of the fact that um, this is a bean and it can, use, it can use dependency injection. So there's a few different ways we can, we can do dependency injection in Micronaut. We can do this. Just use Jakarta.inject. And this will get wired in. Now, this, this is one thing that's kind of funny. Uh, IntelliJ support for Micronaut is really great, but one thing it doesn't know is that there, w at compile time, the implementation will have been created. So it's warning me that there is no bean that can be a, a, an injection candidate, um, but that's just because it doesn't know. Now, one thing you typically see with Spring is um, you do a private inject. Micronaut supports this, but it requires reflection. Micronaut doesn't like reflection. So typically, just keep it at package scope. And the reason that the package scope is not important, but the reason that it works is that every bean, you know, I, I mentioned that the, the interface that we created will be, there will be a class that implements that interface that has all the, the methods filled out to do all that work. Um, but even here, the, the um, there will be a bean class and a bean definition class and a whole bunch of other support classes that will be created to register this in the, in the context. Um, and that will have all the, all the work that, that you don't want to have to manage for doing the, the dependency injection stuff. Um, so, and that will be created in the same package as the package of the class or the interface. So the class, a class like this that doesn't need to get injected anywhere, um, a method like this, which I'll talk about in a sec, that is only going to be called by the framework. Leave it packet scope. It's resolvable. Doesn't need reflection. You can, if if you did need to call this from elsewhere, you can make it public, but we just don't need to. So I'm not going to use this. I'm going to use the constructor injection. So just like in Spring, if there is a single constructor and it takes bean types for its arguments, if it has, it, you know. If, if it, doesn't, if it has at least one argument, uh, you can also inject properties. Um, then that's considered a dependency injection constructor. You can, if you want, to be really explicit, you can say at inject. But that's, that's just redundant because it's obvious that it's the dependency, instruction, the dependency injection constructor. All right, so this class exists to, at startup, capture this event. So it implements... So the, the actual bean class is going to implement an interface that allows it to be um, sent events of a particular type. And you don't have to tell it what type of event listener it is because at code scanning time, it's going to know from the type of the argument what types to listen for. So when we don't really care about the data in the event, we just need to know that we are ready to start up. This is one of the last things that happens before the server uh, web server starts up. Um, so just before everything else is wired up, just after everything's wired up and before we're actually going to do any real work, we'll sneak in there. And if we don't have any instances yet, we're going to um, pers persist a few just so we have some dummy data. One other cool thing is that this is at transactional. So this isn't a Micronaut annotation. It's just a standard JavaX transaction. We're moving in Micronaut 4 to all Jakarta. We've partially migrated to Jakarta. Um, so if this fails, if anything in there fails, it'll get rolled back, just like you know, you know, you know transactional behavior. If, if everything succeeds, it gets committed. Everything, anything fails, it gets rolled back. Um, so that is that. Oh yeah, and then this is one other cool thing. So Micronaut has a really sophisticated. Um, 
requirements sort of DSL language where um, you can say that um, this will only be active if there's no other beans of this type or if, if, if this class exists in the class path, then it's active or, or it's not active. So what we're saying here is don't do this in tests because we're going to do our own data management in tests. Um, so there's a whole bunch of really cool things you can do to control what's live when using the at requires annotation. Okay, so let's create a test for this. Micronaut has great support for testing. Um, by default, we use um, JUnit, but uh, with Groovy, we default to Spock, which if you haven't used it, is amazing. Um, and if you use Kotlin, then you can use Cotest or JUnit if you want. Um, okay, so let's create a test. for some of the behavior that we have. All right, so we annotate this with at micronaut test, which again, uh, makes this thing a dependency injection candidate. It actually makes this a bean. So we can inject thing repository. Now I can use constructor injection, you know, I, I can do different things um, in tests, you know, performance is less important. Um, of course, one of the huge benefits of using constructor injection is that by making the field final, then there's no setter that can be called later and reset. So, but it, you know, in tests, we, we just don't care about that. So, this is a little thing I added to see what is the name of the thing that we're actually what is the actual name of the, the test that we're creating, or the, the thing repository? So we get the initial count, and we save one, and then we save a group of three, and then we assert that we added um, four things, and then we just print them out. And then I added that find by name method. So I create something, and I find it, and I assert that it's present, and that it has the data that I expected. And then if I have some garbage here, then I would assert that that is not present. All right, everyone cross your fingers because we need to hope that the demo gods are with us because this may or may not succeed. I already know what it's going to tell me. It's going to tell me it couldn't resolve the placeholders. Yep. Remember I said in the YAML, we don't want to hard code our passwords, make those external. Well, I haven't provided those. I haven't exported any variables. So let's do that. So that's the password that I used when I created the user. And then I'm setting a wallet password. Now I'll run it again. Now we should see that the flyaway script is going to get run. that. Magic. Okay, so we didn't have to install the Oracle driver. We didn't have to specify the URL. All we did was specify the OCID of the autonomous database instance in the cloud, which has been configured to allow um, public access. Um, and I had to tell it this so it knows what account to use to, to authenticate with. And it runs the Flyway migration, because it detected that there's one to run and that there weren't any in the database. And then it turns out that this is the class name of the thing that gets created. And then it prints all these. So that worked. Magic. 
demigods are happy. Okay. So that's pure database, but let's get some web access. So let's create a controller. Similar patterns, right? We had at JDBC repository on the repository interface to tell Micronaut that um, it's a repository and it should do its magic there. We're making this a controller, which is default scope singleton. This is the thing I mentioned before. So this is the non-blocking stuff. Do this work on the IO thread. And we can, we can put this per method or at the class level because this whole, because everything in the controller is, um, doing database access. Um, we'll just, I'll just annotate the, the, at the class level. And then we create methods that are endpoints with, um, so these are two gets and a post. You can, you know, we support delete and put and all the standard stuff. Um, so we've got, um, and again, uh, constructor injection. So we're injecting the repository because the controller doesn't know how to go to the database, right? That's the responsibility of this guy. So get with a URI of slash thing slash the number, and it's optional again, so it's, if it doesn't find it, it'll, it'll return a 404. It'll serialize that to JSON. Get all the instances, and here's a one we can use to create the instance. So we could return just the thing, but what, what I'm returning here instead is the uh, Micronaut response which is going to be backed by the native response or the whatever native response is actually there. Uh, and it's going to have a, allows you a lot more control over, over um, like I, I left these commented out, but you can add in headers, you can s send redirects, you can um, do all kinds, of, all kinds of stuff. You can also just return the, like here, um, you can just return the instance and you could say like uh, at status, You can set the status uh, with a annotation, um, but we'll set it. We'll create the. We'll send a two hundred one created this way. All right. So because it's going to take a while. Actually, I'll do this. So I'm going to create a native image, native executable, using Gradle. And there's, there's an equivalent. If you use Maven, there's equivalent commands over there. This is going to take about three minutes. So I don't want to <laughs> make you guys kind of sit there and stare at the screen for three minutes. So it's going to do, like I was saying, it's going to do that aggressive analysis of everything. It's going to uh, throw an exception if there's unexpected um, reflection or dynamic class loading, um, but only if it's unexpected. If you if it does fail, you can just create the config file to tell it what to expect. But you know, of course, we haven't really done anything fancy, so there's nothing out of, out of line here. So this will just work. So while that's running, let's create a controller test to see something even cooler. So. All right, this, so this uses some pretty slick stuff in Micronaut. Again, it's at Micronaut test, so that's going to start up the application context. It's going to start a server um, on a dynamic port. So it's not going to run on port 8080. It's going to run, it's just going to find a, an open port and start on that. Now, in order to make requests over to the controller, because this is actually going to be running a web server. So in order to create a request to that controller, I can use the at client annotation 
tell it what it's going to make requests to. And just like in the controller, I used at get at post to declare how you call this thing, how this thing is called. I can use those same annotations to tell it how to call, what requests to make, to create a post request, to create a get request. And then I can inject this client any of multiple ways, right? So the micronaut test annotation adds in um, a JUnit support um, for parameter injection. So I could use the add inject, I could use constructor injection, but if this thing is only, if this client is only used for this one test, then this is the, cl the cleanest way to do it. Um, so I get my initial stuff, and then I create one and assert that it was created successfully and that it has an ID because I didn't specify one when I created it. And then the, I get all of them again and assert that there's one more and that the original collection can, um, is contained in the later collection. And then I'm going to test the failing case. So in the controller, I had a constraint. I said this number has to be positive, which is just a JavaX validation annotation. So when you make requests here, it's going to validate that, and it's going to throw an exception if it's invalid. So I, I'm going to use the assert throws from JUnit, tell it what to expect, do this thing, and the test will fail if it doesn't throw that exception. But if it does, then I can get the exception, and because it's a Micronaut uh, exception class, it has the response, the error response, it has the status, it has all the stuff. So I would expect that this is going to create a bad request response. Three minutes, 43, you're almost done. All right, let's run this. And again, placeholders, right? So, okay. So, it just created a rather large file, 168 megs. It's pretty big for an application a lot bigger than the jar file that we would have created. But this does not even need a JDK. So this, this just runs. So if I create a compute instance right now, of course this wouldn't run because this is built for Macs, but I can use a little trick with Docker. I can create the native executable in a Docker container, which uses Alpine Linux or anything compatible with the, the cloud instance that we're going to create. Um, and then you can extract that file out of the image, out of the container. Um, and then SCP that up to the cloud without any JDK, with just bare bones um, compute instance, it'll it'll run and start right up. So of course it'll run here. Right, my test passed. Now this isn't going to. Oh, again, this environment variables. So this isn't going to start up lightning fast because we're connecting to an Oracle database in the cloud. So that takes some time. But um, when I was playing with this earlier, so this starts up in about nine seconds. If I kill this and start it back up again, there is some OS caching. So once it's cached, it'll start up quicker the you know, subsequent times to get a more reasonable um, idea of how long it takes. Um, should start up in, right, that was more. But um, this is definitely slower, uh, faster than it would have been for the jar version. And if I search for this, it's only using 84 megs. And when I was testing this earlier, 
the jar version runs in about 270 megs of memory. So this is lean and mean. It has 100% of the functionality. Um, so this is really, really, I mean, obviously, this is great for Kubernetes. This is great for Docker. This is great for if you're auto-creating, auto-scaling tons and tons of instances, you want them to start up lightning fast. Um, so native image plus micronaut gives you just lots and lots of cool stuff. So that's what I got. Thank you to the demo gods. I didn't have to sacrifice any chickens this time. And it just worked. So um, that was a lot in a really short period of time. Uh, any questions? Nothing, anything didn't make sense? Let me go back to the deck. Maybe take a photo of that. Because, um, like I said, huge amount of resources there. Um, very active community. Gitter is very busy. We, um, um, we, not quite, not, we don't get quite the traffic on Stack Overflow that we used to get with Grails, but um, maybe that's an indication that Micronauts just easier to use and people don't need so much help. Um, so another thing I, I should mention is so the, the MN executable. So you can, you can use it in um, So there's all these features. So that, that's one way to use it. Or you can just say MN create app if you know how, what you're doing. stuff. And that is available because I installed it with SDK man. Um, so pretty cool stuff. And other than that, thank you for your time.